Hi everybody, welcome back to yet another video. Today we are going to go into life in the 17th century in the English colonies. So what we've done so far, if you've watched the previous videos and we're tracking it through, first we started with period one um, and we looked at the development of, of what life was like before European contact and once the Europeans came over, how that changed things. Then uh, we looked at the different reasons for the Europeans coming over. Then we went into a greater depth into why did people settle each of the 13 colonies and what um, caused individuals to come over and what made the British colonies so unique. And we went through really the founding and the big picture stuff. Now we're going to kind of zoom in a little bit closer here and we're going to look at what is life like in the English colonies. We're going to be looking at culture. We're going to be looking at major events. Um, across the English colonies and how they really change over time. So now that we have the complete shell of this time period of period one and two, we're going to zoom in and we're going to look at economic, social, and political um, cultural changes or major events in the English colonies um, throughout the 1600s. So let's get going. Our essential question to really connect everything is thinking about how did the difference in values um, affect the unique cultures of each colonial region, whether it's the Chesapeake colonies, the Southern colonies, New England colonies, or the Middle colonies. So once more, we're kind of building on top of what we've already done and looking for those connective pieces. We looked at the context for colonization of North America, um, and we looked at uh, how and why different European colonies really developed, and, ex and now we're looking more at the expansion piece, but why were they settled? Then um, we've continued to look and will continue to look at how Europeans and natives, um, their relationship changed over time. Why did they interact and in what ways did they interact? Um, we'll also begin introducing more heavily um, the topic of slavery in the British colonies. Um, the causes of that, we looked a little bit about the, the desire for the cash crop industry, but now we're going to be really rearing in the effects of that and how that changes over time. Also, how um, these enslaved people actually responded to the slavery system. Did they accept it? Um, was it more violent rebellion? Was it more subversive? And we'll look at that throughout. Um, and also, basically, why did all of these different people come over? And how does American culture develop over time? Um, where does it come from? Where do we really become American? And that's going to be sort of up for you to decide. Lastly, just looking at how the different goals and interests of whether it be the European leaders or um, the different kings and queens or um, the, the individual colonists that come over, how do these people affect the personality and development of the colonies? And probably the most important piece and the reason why we're looking at period one and period two, right, that stuff before the French and Indian War, is we're looking for the answer or the ability to tackle objective J down here, comparing the effects of the development of colonial society in various regions of North America. So why do these things come up? Yes, we've looked at that. We'll continue to look at that and, and how do they change, but what are gonna be the impacts of this on say the American Revolution, on early American culture, on the division of early political parties, on the development of our economy in the early 1800s and the leading up to the Civil War? All of these things are big picture trends that we're seeing. So let's go into things. When we're looking in the 1650s, so um, first permanent English settlement is Jamestown in 1607. In 1650, um, this is what the English colonies will look like. Now notice it is definitely, definitely not um, this massive sprawling colonies like we typically imagine or the picture in our head. Um, we have the New England colonies and we have the Chesapeake colonies, which is why we studied them first. The Chesapeakes come first, followed by um, the New England colonies. And so they're right on the water. They're not this super deep populated area, um, but we do have some early development. So what is life like in these areas? So this early culture development, this is where we're going to be seeing. By the time we get to the 1700s, though, 50 years in the future, this is going to be more so like what the colonies will claim they look like. But please do note that not all of this is settled, right? We have this uh, kind of area of, of European settlement right here, these kind of 
lines here and here, here, right? So this map might be a little bit misleading, right? This is where a bulk of it's going to be, but that is definitely an expansion, right? That's definitely an expansion. So where does this growth come from and how is this growth gonna affect culture? We're gonna start at the top and work down. Um, we're gonna start in colonial society in New England first. Society in New England was probably the most stable out of any of the other colonies. Um, you talk about the type of people that are coming over to this region. Um, a lot of them are coming over as families. They're not these individuals just coming to make it rich and they're sort of on their own. Um, these are people that want to, and, and even look at the name. It seems so basic, but it's right in front of your face. It is a new England. They want to take their lives from England and they want to create a new one. Um, the reason these Puritans came over was not for economic reasons. They came over for religious reasons, whether they wanted to be separatists and break away. But most of the Puritans, um, they just wanted to purify um, the religion and they wanted to be separate from these liberal changes they see happening in Europe. Um, but what they want is they want just kind of their new life. And so they're bringing their family over as a whole. And so it becomes easier um, to have a little sense of normalcy. Um, marriage was extremely easy because if you weren't Puritan, you were gone. So there was a lot of uh, similar shared values. They were very strict and staunch on that. And because of that, towns really kind of became these small interconnected networks of families that were really, which is kind of gross, but intermarried. Um, these people had a lot of similar values. A lot of them were related in some way or another, if you kept tracing it back. Um, but it, it, this kind of develops these individual areas, these individual towns based on tight family communities. And, and that really develops um, the New England towns in that way. A lot of these many little small towns all throughout. And you see this, for example, when you look throughout towns across Massachusetts. The colonists ended up living a lot longer um, in the New England region more than anywhere else. A um, couple reasons. Number one, dispersed population. So they weren't tightly compacted like the problems they saw in Europe with overcrowding, diseases carrying, sickness carrying very quickly. Um, so that helps. If there were diseases carried by insects, they would die in the winter um, because so they have this cooler climate, a little bit more comfortable than the long, hot, humid climate down south. And um, they also have pure water, which is really, really important if you want to uh, kind of live um, for a longer time. Now, yes, people live longer, which is important, but think about what that could produce. Um, in New England, um, some textbooks will say, or some readings will say that New England invents grandparents. Um, and what they mean by that is people are living longer than they are anywhere else in the other colonies. You have your parents and you grow up knowing your parents, but you never knew your parents' parents because the life expectancy was not that long. In New England, that begins to change, which is extremely revolutionary. And it really became one of the first societies not just in American history, but we're talking in most all of world history to actually expect to live long enough to see their grandchildren. These are not the first people to see their grandchildren. It's happened before in history. But this is the first time that you're expected to. It's almost odd if you don't um, eventually as time goes on. And so the life expectancy really does increase. And this does affect New England culture. It's a very tight knit family, small farming communities. So we say that, yes, people are living longer, but how much longer, right? This is the settlement in the 1700s. We have the Chesapeake region, we have New England. But look at this graph, right? The life expectancy of a male when they reach the age of 20, kind of how long are, are they possibly going to live? It's compared to people living in New England, people living in the Chesapeake region, people living in England. The Chesapeake region is the lowest, living maybe around 50 years old. If you're living in England, maybe around 55. If you're living in New England, closer to 70 years old. You are expected to live 20 years longer if you live in New England versus if you live in the Chesapeake region. If you're living in Massachusetts Bay versus living in Jamestown. That is huge, colossal, right? You're still living 15 years longer than if you were living in London, England. Um, and, and even though it's not maybe as settled and perhaps furnished as the the big cities of Europe, your life expectancy is much longer. And that's definitely going to impact the way that they perceive themselves, longer terms of education, um, right? increased kind of oral history and, and passing on that information and lineage for sure. 
education becomes so important, right? As you have these multi-generational homes, um, multi-generational towns, um, it, it becomes fundamental. It's, it, it's essential to kind of the Puritan way of life. Um, they begin creating early elementary schools funded with sort of local taxation. And again, remember, this is not external. This is not from the crown. This is not from anywhere else. They are choosing to do that for themselves to allow them to run. So they are controlling their own government. It's self-governed. Um, and because of that, New England throughout the 1600s and 1700s is going to have by far the highest literacy rate in all of what becomes America. And this is going to continue into the American Revolution. So think about where these major pamphlets are being passed around. Those are happening up in New England during the American Revolution, things like common sense, right? Once the Declaration of Independence gets out and things like that, it's easier for that type of text and literacy to be read, engaged in later on. In 1638, which isn't very long um, after really the settlement, Harvard became America's very first college. So been around for a very long time, right? And that presence, that long lasting history, right? Um, uh, in the United States really comes from this time period. And that comes from the life expectancy. It comes from the religious expectations of the Puritans of hard work, education, kind of self-discipline. And this all comes to impact New England culture. What about women? Um, was this really a great era or time for women? Um, women really were wives and mothers um, for the most part. Um, but they were able to do some other things in New England society. Um, very religious, devout church members. Some of them ran small scale farms. However, um, the biggest thing to really stress is inequality um, is there. This is not saying that although it's a society based on religious values, um, the prevailing social ideas of the time do penetrate religion. And so because of that, women are not considered equal. Um, they couldn't own or sell property. Um, women really couldn't initiate divorces. Um, and it was very, very difficult to get a divorce. Um, and women were only allowed to do what God ordained. And who were these ministers that were interpreting what God ordained? They were men. So women are not going to have freedom. Um, They're not going to have that opportunity. And we're going to see this sort of protracted struggle for a lot of different groups, whether we look at for African Americans in the new world, whether we look at um, women um, going forward, or whether we look at the relationship with natives, different minority groups all the way throughout. And we can even look at this as kind of a power struggle when we start looking at the Jamestown colonies in terms of wealth. Um, so we'll look at this continued trend over time. So this is definitely not something to forget about. This is kind of the beginning stepping stones going forward. Now, what does society look like? What, like what's the social hierarchy? Who's on the top of, of, of New England society? Who's in the middle? Who's on the bottom, right? Who's making up these different groups? Well, at the top, um, the religiously devout family that's guiding the town meetings, these town hall gatherings are essentially their run governments in these towns. The church dominates society. If you're not a member of the church, you can't really participate. Um, and so they are the people that are controlling what's happening because the church is going to guide any local laws. It's more of a theocracy than anything else. In the middle, um, there's this massive population, what we call yeoman farmers. Yeoman are um, subsistence farmers. Um, they're loyal to the local community. Um, they're not really religious, but they're helping keep the society going. So they're not at the top. They're definitely not at the bottom because they play a key role, but they're definitely a large part. And at the very, very, very bottom, um, you have people that don't have any land, right? Land equals power. Um, land equals political voice. Um, anybody that's a servant, um, the poorest in society at the absolute low, absolute below everybody else, right? They're, they're not providing um, in the same way as others. So they're definitely at the lowest rung of society. The big thing um, about New England society is that you had to be a part of the church. Um, it really focuses solely on their members. And because the church dictates society, you really want to be part of those church members. If you can't, um, or you're not providing anything else, you're not really going to be in the same playing field as others. So um, those that are members of the church are um, those that are going to have the higher social standing. 
Um, people that disagreed with it, dissented like Roger Williams are going to get kicked out or some individuals move away, create their own opportunities elsewhere. Like you see with kind of like, um, New Hampshire or, or Connecticut, New Haven, people looking for better opportunities elsewhere. Now we move down to the other major colonial, um, region, the Chesapeake, right? In the 17th century, because these are kind of our two areas to really fit in. So let's go down to the Chesapeake. So the big question is, how is this different than New England? Or else we could have just lumped them all together and it would have made no difference if I specified what region we were talking about. But it is very, very different. Even though they're coming over at the similar times, um, they're very, very different. Um, and this can stem all the way back from their motives to come over. But the normal English lifestyle that we saw in New England, why people came over, um, affected that because it, it wasn't really altering that that part. Um, it, it's not possible in Virginia. It's really not possible in Jamestown. Um, you talk about even who is coming over. 70 to 85% of immigrants were young male indentured servants. So one, young, right? Male, right? Unmarried, typically men, indentured servants. These were people that could not pay their own way. They had other people pay for them and they sold themselves as a servant for a certain amount of time. And indentured is a contract. So they're kind of a contracted servant for X amount of years. And that's 70 to 85% of the people that were coming over. So 70 to 85% were just young male indentured servants. The death rate is extremely high, right? You're living at times 20 years less than those living in New England. Um, so you don't really have that stability. You're definitely not going to be seeing your grandchildren. That's not the norm by any means. Um, one married spouse would usually die within a decade. Um, it, it's not common to have these long lasting family relationships like you saw in New England, like you saw even back in England. Um, and so life is going to be very, very different. And that's going to deeply impact culture. Um, children sometimes didn't even know their parents because their parents would die, um, so quickly because of disease, because of kind of the inconsistency of conditions and, and, and the lack of resources at times. So it's very, very, very different than what we see in New England. So I made a point of mentioning on the last slide that 70 to 85 percent of those coming to the Chesapeake colonies were young male male indentured servants. So because of that, there's a very, very small female population. So because the women right, are in such high demand, but very, very little supply, they do actually have a lot of power um, in, in, in kind of in the marriage market in the sense that um, they're a hot commodity and, and people may want them to have children to carry on their name. And so um, there is a, a little bit of choice there and, and they can kind of move uh, up a little bit socially um, and to improve their status quite quickly um, because there's not many options, um, which may not have been the case that they had for themselves back in England or in, in some other colonies. So this was pretty unique. However, to say that women had more power in society would be an absolute farce. Um, women were still vulnerable to sexual exploitation. Um, if you were having children, it was still very dangerous. Again, the death rate is still um, high. You have diseases. You don't have the access to maybe fresh water sources as you do up in New England. The conditions are hot. Um, um, diseases can carry for longer. Um, and, and, and women in the Chesapeake died on average 20 years earlier than women in New England. So both men and women died about 15 to 20 years earlier than those in New England. So it's not the same conditions that you would expect um, for individuals as a whole in the Chesapeake versus what's happening up in New England. Now we're going to take a look at what this social pyramid would look like in the Chesapeake region. Now, try to kind of anticipate what you might see, who might be at the very top, who might be at the bottom, or kind of how you would rank things. And I want you to try to think about that on your own before I reveal this. And think about, right, what happened in New England. In New England, it was founded for religious reasons. So those that are the most religiously devout or the church members are at the very, very top of society, right? And it works its way down. In the Chesapeake, it was not founded for religious reasons. It was founded 
for monetary reasons. It was founded for people to get rich and find money. The best way to, to get extreme wealth this time is going to be tobacco, and this is going to be the biggest cause of inequality. So those that have these large tobacco plantations are going to be at the top of society. So the planters are going to dominate society, and they're going to dominate um, the House of Burgesses as well, this legislative assembly. They're going to have a lot of pull there. Um, they are going to be the people that are going to be more up for that legislature that's going to control these politics because they control the money. Below them, you're going to have some yeoman farmers, which are, again, subsistence farmers. Um, this is going to be the largest class of people in the Chesapeake. So although the plantation owners at the very top are going to control a majority of the power, they are not going to be a majority of the society. And this is going to become more stark, more contrasted once we get into the 1800s. Most of the yeoman farmers, they came over as indentured servants. Um, they were right on the edge of poverty in most cases, maybe just keeping their head above, right below. Um, so a majority of the wealth sits in a, a minority of the population up at the, uh, at the plantation class. So if this is really the bulk of society, what's left? Well, below them, you have the actual indentured servants, the indentured servants that aren't free. Um, most of these indentured servants are usually mistreated. They're cheated out of land or these rights. At the end of the indenture, the plantation owners are supposed to give them land, give them tools to be able to start up. And even if they do give them land, it's going to be really, really crappy land. And at the very, very, very bottom of society, you really have to understand this sort of caste system where African slaves cannot break out of that mold. Because of the color of their skin, they are stuck in the bottom rung of society. So no matter how poor these indentured servants get, how terrible their conditions are, they will always be held above African slaves in society. Now, um, how is this really going to change culture? Um, well, number one, we're talking about social mobility. It's really limited for most people. Now we talk about how women could marry up, but, but even there, there are some, there's some cost to that. Um, in just be culture, it's really, really hard. Um, the American born elite class really begins to emerge. So the people that are born to the aristocracy, the people that are born to the planters, um, it really begins to come. And you think about why does it come towards the end of the 1600s? Well, the original founders in, in the early 1600s that founded Jamestown, 1607, if you start having lineage from there of people that start planting tobacco early on and why everyone's sort of equal, but they're starting pulling apart. By the time you get to the end where you're a generation or maybe even two deep into this, um, that your grandparents founded um, Jamestown, then you're going to have a longer line to set things up, whether if you were an indentured servant coming over. So there is definitely social disparity beginning to emerge. Um, the plantation system, um, economically and socially with like the ownership of slaves, um, really allows these plantation owners to produce more um, tobacco. And so it becomes this heavy demand desire from the world economy. And so they start trying to feed into that beast. Um, it's going to focus solely on economics. That's going to be the centralized focus. It was the reason why they came over. And because it's the reason they came over, they're going to continue because they're making themselves filthy, filthy rich. Um, and it's not going to be based around towns and smaller communities like you see in New England. Not to mention that, so their original motive, but couple that with higher death rates to disease, the climate. Um, um, it's going to not really lend itself to the development of schools, of towns, and so they're going to lag behind in that result, but they're going to start making a lot more money earlier on. So we've looked at these two regions, but Although we're talking about these regions, we're really talking about white history in those regions. What is it like for slaves during the 1600s? Um, African slaves really become this huge basis of a need for labor. Originally, it was tried with Native Americans, sort of in the encomienda system of the Spanish. That doesn't really work as well. Um, they are absolutely killed by European diseases, so your working population is going to disappear. There's an indentured servitude pool that continues to come over, but by the mid-1600s and later 1600s, um, that amount of indentured servants that you have is really dying away. Um, and there's going to be a couple reasons why, but it's really going to start to die out and fizzle out. Um, by the time we get to the middle or end of the 1600s, um, it's going to be a large amount that continues to grow when you're talking about the amount of slaves brought into the English colonies. Um, kind of an estimated because there's not a, a full hard track of this, but about 11 million slaves, most of them were male, 
were brought to the English colonies. Um, it was not needed at this time to reproduce with slaves because you have the international slave trade where you could keep bringing more slaves in. Um, what's going to happen once the international slave trade is abolished, the domestic slave trade is going to spike and there are going to be African slaves that are forced to reproduce in the new world in order to keep that population going. What I think is important to note is this development over time. And it's important for the course, but I think important just for history to understand where this really starts to change. Um, slaves were originally brought over 1619, the very first time African slaves set foot in the Jamestown colony. Um, and they were originally treated as indentured servants, but as time goes on and there's an increased amount of Africans being brought over to the new world, um, to the British colonies, um, more and more uh, slave laws are going to be sort of being implemented. In Virginia, for example, in 1672, really strict slave laws are going to be implemented and it's going to create a shift from indentured servitude to actual slavery. Africans become defined as slaves for life. There's this permanent slave status that's passed on to slave children. So if you are a slave and you have a child, your child is a slave from birth. There is nothing you can do to break out of that, creating this caste system. And by 1700, slavery was based exclusively on skin color. Right? There were not white slaves, white indentured servants, but not white slaves. The indentured servitude population really begins to fizzle out. And so there's this shift towards full on African slavery in the uh, future United States of America, in the British 13 colonies. There is a shift towards that. The other thing I think it's important to mention is that there is slavery everywhere. It is not just in the Southern colonies, although that's where it's gonna take its deepest roots. This map really shows you, one, where these slaves are being brought from, and two, where they are going. You'll see that, yes, there are some coming from the southeastern coast of Africa, but a majority of um, African slaves in the New World are coming from the western coast of Africa. Geographically, it's the closest. Um, and two, there's already contact with Europeans, so the built-up diseases is stronger than that of Native Americans. There are some um, being sent um, to South America, Central America, and the 13 colonies, even a small percentage going up to Europe. But look at where most of them are going. 38% going to Brazil for the Portuguese, but 42%, the largest percentage, is going to the West Indies, the Caribbean, um, where Columbus originally lands looking for those precious metals. Only 4% heading to British North America, but this will definitely change over time. In the Chesapeake and Southern colonies, there's really a large black population that's beginning um, to bloom. And what's unique about this time period is that the slaves actually found it easier to preserve and keep their African culture, even though they were in the British 13 colonies. When you're looking at the actual percentage in some areas, in Virginia, 40% of the population was black. In South Carolina, 60% of the population was black black, which is absolutely astonishing. And this is going to stay a very high number, even in the 1800s, where it's going to get to points where the African slave system, although it's going to be much more severe, the international slave system would have died um, decades prior, even um, leading up to the Civil War, the black population in South Carolina outnumbers the white. Um, by 1720, um, the African population really became more self-sustaining. Um, fertility rates in, uh, exceeded immigration rates. So what that means is you are able to um, conceive and bear children at a greater number than you need bringing in. So even though, as we saw on that chart, only 4% went to um, the British colonies in North America, the ability to um, bear children, conceive and bear children successfully, it's gonna allow for the population to grow. Um, and this really doesn't occur in the Caribbean and South America um, because of two things. One, the harsh, harsh working conditions. It begins much more extreme in the Caribbean and South America. And then some of that's gonna matriculate and head up into the deep South. But number two, also the climate doesn't really allow for that. And so what's going to happen is even though more slaves are brought in larger numbers to the Caribbean and South America, the um, population of slaves in the United States of America, the future United States of America, the British 13 colonies is going to be more self-sustaining.
when you're looking at um, kind of where these slaves are, um, most people think that they're just in the South, but what's important to remember is it's more than just in the South. Um, you have enslaved blacks, right? You have slaves, but there are also free blacks um, um, in, in the colonies, but they're also in the New England colonies and the middle colonies. Why? There's not a need for it as much, um, especially in the New England colonies with these small scale farms, maybe performing as servants, but it's not really needed in New England. In the middle colonies, even in a place like Pennsylvania that's, that's growing the bread basket, um, that's growing um, wheat and things like that, it, it's not as necessary for those means, for the uh, cash crop industry, for the tobacco industry that they're growing in such wide numbers, it's um, built as much more of a need uh, has to happen. So this is gonna change the colonies in the way that um, the desire for slavery, the number of slaves, and even um, the diversity of said populations. These stricter laws um, and this greater dependence on slavery really leads to a, a deepened, widespread, open resentment um, of the slave status by these Africans, that it's gonna lead to heavy resistance in the 18th century, so the 1700s. Great example of this would be an armed resistance such as the Stono Rebellion in 1739. Stono Rebellion is a pretty big event, um, I think, and we'll talk about it because it can really unlock so many different pieces of American history. Um, we can see even 1741, um, 106 slaves were hanged or deported due to a rumor that the slaves were gonna plan to burn down New York City. Um, and runaways were common. It's not just the Underground Railroad in the 1800s. There's resistance, there's open resistance. In the 1700s, people didn't just accept the fact that they were slaves. That's, that's absolutely asinine and so wrong. Um, during this time period, we see this development of happening, but there is going to be a reaction to these where after um, the Stono Rebellion, for example, the Virginia Slave Codes are gonna be implemented. Um, the way that the slave rebellion is going to be depicted, as you see here, of this torch burning things down, um, the innocent, innocent whites here that are the slave owners um, and the slaves murdering, stabbing, beating children. Um, it's going to be depicted as very, very, very brutal savages. And this can be justification for enacting harsher, stricter slave codes. Um, this was a, a pretty large rebellion. 150 slaves rose up. They took arms. Um, they killed different planters. They tried to march from downtown before they were um, taken down and most every single one of them slaughtered and killed. Um, and because of that, right, stricter laws will be implemented because of this idea of fear. Um, and we can even see this in our depiction here, just like our depiction of the Powhatan massacre in 1622 of Jamestown, right? Why would the creator of this drawing depict it the way that they do? Why did they cho choose to depict the um, the whites in the way that they did or the blacks in the way that they did, right? What is this telling us? What is their inherent bias, right? What are they trying to influence? What are they trying to achieve by crafting the document in the way that they do? And we can see some inherent biases here, perhaps towards showing, trying to show the innocence of these slaveholders and, um, and their attempt to show savagery, barbaric nature, of these Africans. So um, this slave rebellion is gonna be one example of many that we're gonna see, um, some not as large as this, nor as successful as this, but there's gonna be impact. Even though they were not able to completely overthrow society, there are severe impacts to this. An um, example would be the Virginia Slave Code, so stricter slave laws coming as a result. The British colonies are not independent. Um, they are the property of the British crown of England, and so they're going to fit into the larger commercial empire, but the colonies are going to become extremely lucrative, extremely valuable, and so we're going to see where that relationship takes it and how that really affects its development. When you're looking at the colonies, um, they're extremely diverse in um, a variety of things, but also even in just their economy. You can use this key over here on the left just to see a couple of things. For example, what's going on up in New England versus what's going on in the southern colonies or the middle colonies, all very unique. They're using their environment. They're using their geography to allow their colonies to develop in a certain way. For example, you see the fishing, the shipbuilding industry, the timber industry, 
up in New England. You see the cash crop industry um, um, down south, things like indigo um, and then tobacco, and you see wheat um, being grown in the middle colonies. So they each serve their own purpose for one, sustaining themselves, the colonies around them, their own commerce, but also the commerce of the British Empire as a larger whole. The way that the British colonies fit into the larger picture is they were a massive supplier of raw goods. Um, in Europe, there was already this sort of industrial um, kind of revolution that was happening, and, and so they had this greater um, processing power, and you needed these raw materials in order to process these goods. So where are they going to come from? These brand new colonies. Um, the colonies would take these raw goods, they would send them to Britain, Britain would then manufacture them, and they would send them back to the North American colonies. They would also take those manufactured goods and they would send them to Africa to trade for slaves. Then these slaves would be sent to the West Indies, um, which would get more raw materials, send them back. So it's part of this larger um, kind of spectrum. But probably one of the biggest things that we need to draw attention to is this right here, something called the Middle Passage. This trading of supplies back and forth between um, the North American colonies and the West African coast, trading rum, trading supplies back to Africa in exchange for slaves for labor back to North America. And this is sometimes called the triangular trade. And you can see this shape forming here, right, between um, Great Britain, Africa, and North America, and how they all fit together. These raw materials affecting the development of these colonies. When we're looking at how the colonies developed, um, they were more so independent. There wasn't a lot of royal intervention. Um, the, the policy of salutary neglect, of um, neglecting to enforce certain laws or rules in the colonies as long as they weren't causing any sort of upheaval, uprising. They were doing their job. They were doing their part. And so the colonies weren't really state funded, nor were they state protected. And by state, we're talking about the government as a whole. So these were usually independent investors. And number one, they were not being protected by the British crown. However, Charles II in the middle of the 1600s really begins to change that. Um, maximizing exports, decreasing imports, so meaning you're selling more than you're buying, generating a lot more government revenue. And the benefits and the possibilities of the British colonies begin to really be seen. And there's this huge investment in looking at how can we utilize and maximize this extremely lucrative colonial system that we have found in the British 13 colonies. Mercantilism begins to develop um, as the general blueprint for how England's um, kind of imperial economy is going to work. There is this sort of cause and effect, this connecting relationship, as you can sort of see in the cartoon down below. You have the mother country right here, which is going to be Great Britain, um, which is where all these resources are going to be coming from. You are going to have the colonies um, bringing in raw materials that are going to be taken. They are going to be produced into manufactured goods, which are then sold back to the colonies and other places. And so the colonies become the supplier and they become an awesome supplier of raw goods and materials. Um, there was this want for more money and this great balance of trade, right? That balance of trade, you're exporting more than you're importing, meaning you're selling more than you're buying, you're increasing your profit. We're trying to eliminate our rivals in the Dutch um, that are, although a tiny country, are an economically prosperous one. And so we have eventually um, this threat immediately by our British colonies in New Amsterdam, which eventually becomes New York once it's taken over. And there is really a desire for a stronger navy to support this trade network. So mercantilism, you may see the word merchant in as there is almost like a base root word, right? It's all about trade. That's the key thing here. So you got to give something to get something, but we are controlling all sides of the trade as an empire. So the North American colonies for Britain, the 13 colonies are providing this massive amount of raw material, which is going to Britain, who is producing and selling this, selling this in Europe, selling these back to the colonists, selling these to Africans um, who are trading for slaves. Those slaves are brought into the Caribbean or also brought into the British 13 colonies, which are used to harvest and produce even more raw materials and keep this cycle moving.
Um, there is this emphasis on um, colonial restriction of trade that's going to begin to develop in 1660 and 1663. The Navigation Acts very simply say um, you cannot trade with anybody else besides um, one, Great Britain, or two, another British colony. So they're controlling who they can trade with. They're trying to keep all of the money and all of the profits in house, right? They're controlling where you can navigate to. That's the way that I think about it, who you're gonna be able to trade with. And so because of this, first it starts um, up with uh, just going to England, and then um, it talks about even more specifically the most um, profitable goods can only be sent to English ports so that there's no sort of in-between or no sort of kind of offhand trades being done, again, to keep all this money in-house. And eventually, right, um, it takes even more so where there are some loopholes um, that are, are, are being seen for, for some of these traders that they make it so that all goods shipped to English colonies have to pass through England. So the price um, is really um, paid by the colonial consumers even more because there's extra fees and taxes to go through and hurdles to jump through. But the whole goal of the colonies from the royal crown's point of view is to make more money for the mother country, make more money for them. That's the sole reason why these colonies exist. Um, the New England merchants really tried to find ways to get around this so they didn't have to pay these taxes. And that is what causes the British to put in stricter laws. By 1696, um, the Board of Trade was created to oversee colonial trade. So there's more oversight being seen as we go on and the colonists are trying to wiggle around to have more freedom right this is a restriction on their economic freedom that they're trying to find loopholes to get around um, there were maritime courts which meaning is kind of naval courts to mediate any of these trade shipping disputes and eventually eventually the navigation acts will um, benefit these colonial merchants because they have a continual supply of a buyer, right? And it's going to stimulate and hold up the um, economy of the British 13 colonies. And so it's going to go from first being very restrictive to eventually where there are some walls that are sort of broken down, that there is a continual buyer and a feeder that as much as we can produce, they will buy. And we're sending it over, sending it over. So those controlling that shipping, those controlling that trading, those controlling those plantations are continue to be able to elevate their social status and become even more wealthy. During the end of the 1600s, the British colonies were not all super peaceful, holding hands, singing kumbaya. There was a lot of different problems, not just with the way that they were governed and maybe their relationship um, with the British crown, but also inside the colonies. And so people um, are going to start to see change as a result of some of these um, revolts during this time period. There was some unrest in the British colonies that we really begin to see at the end of the 1600s. But what's important to note is this is not the conflict of the American Revolution or the early American Revolution that we're talking about in the 1600s. That won't come really until after the French and Indian War in the middle of the 1700s. In the 1600s, we're going to see conflict between what we'd say the, the ins and the outs, the haves and the have-nots, who's a part of society and who's not. And we're going to look at three different examples, Bacon's Rebellion, King Philip's War, and really the witchcraft panic or the Salem witch trials um, up in Puritan, Massachusetts. And so we're going to see how each one of these affects the colonies in a very unique way. The first rebellion that we're going to talk about is Bacon's Rebellion. This is going to take place in Jamestown in Virginia. And it has to deal with indentured servants. So when we're looking at the context for this rebellion, for this issue, we have to look at what was it like for indentured servants at this time or right up before this time. Um, it wasn't great, to say the least. Um, most of them lived on the frontier, close to the inland. Um, they were not doing well because of, number one, poor tobacco prices, uh, and two, there were a lot of Native American attacks as they continued to encroach upon that land. As they moved deeper into the frontier, they ran into more conflicts with Native Americans. So we got to figure out why was Bacon, who is Bacon, and why was he so angry?
The whole issue surrounds the context of these problems that indentured servants were having as a whole. These indentured servants blamed Virginia's royal governor, um, Berkeley, for a lot of the problems, not necessarily that he created them, but that he refused to do little to help. He would not go out and he would not help them take out the Native Americans. He would not help them get better land. And so Nathaniel Bacon leads a rebellion in 1676 against Berkeley. He's joined by other small farmers. He's joined by other people that are on the lowest part of society in Jamestown um, and in the surrounding area um, by other people that are on the lowest rung of society, like blacks and women. And they try to hold this rebellion and overthrow the government in Virginia. Bacon's rebellion is gonna be initially successful where they run Berkeley out of Jamestown, they take over, but it's not gonna last very long because Bacon is going to die of dysentery, which is probably the worst way to go. Shout out to the Oregon Trail. Um, dysentery, essentially what you're gonna do uh, is gonna become violently, violently ill, um, and in short, death by diarrhea. Um, you're not gonna have any um, liquid left in your body, dehydrate yourself to death, um, expelling all of that out of your body. Very, very terrible way to go. It's not a very uh, a dainty way in any sort of way or respectable, honorable way to go. Um, but even though after he dies, the rebellion is gonna be completely swashed, they're gonna be kicked out, the same people are gonna take over, even though it's not successful in its original goal does not mean it's not impactful. It creates a ripple effect going forward. The upper class of Virginia, the gentry, the, the plantation owners at the very top are gonna to be convinced that, number one, indentured servants are going to be destined to become rebellious, that you can't keep these white people down forever, that they are going to try to increase their social status. Um, so it's not seen as a more viable form of workforce for this manual labor. So if they are not gonna be this stable force of um, workers, where else are we gonna get them from? And it starts turning towards the idea that African slaves become a better solution than these rebellious whites because the assumption is that African slaves are, are different, like they're a different species. They're lower on sort of this theoretical um, social ladder of this hierarchy of the food chain, if you will. And so because they are black, that they're not going to have this ambition for political power like whites have, right? We see racial superiority nodes there, of course, um, but this becomes sort of the justification. It's an unintended consequence of Bacon's rebellion. This was not the goal that they set out to do. The rebellion wasn't even successful in their initial plan, but the long-term effects are successful as a result. So this is not going to immediately flip overnight and turn, but this is gonna be more of a long-term change we see going forward with this. After the Stono Rebellion, there's gonna be even stricter slave laws. It's gonna to lead towards that movement towards slavery and the deeper entrenchment of slavery. These are a couple depictions of Bacon's Rebellion you see right here. They burned Jamestown to the ground, but again, even though they were not successful in their goal, right, the long-term effects are super important. Now we move up to New England, and in 1675, there's a war that's break, that breaks out called King Philip's War. Now, King Philip was the English name for um, the Native American um, chief by the name of Medicom. And Medicom was a Wampanoag Indian. He binds together these other indigenous tribes to fight back against colonial encroachment. And a war breaks out in New England. At the end of the war, over a thousand natives and colonists are dead. And a massive war debt is left over because of this fighting. This is gonna take place um, in Connecticut, in the western portion of Rhode Island, in Massachusetts as well. Um, and it's going to cause a big debt from the destruction, number one, but needing to fund to fight it to protect these colonies. And so James II um, begins to um, make some big changes. The first big one he does is he annuls, kind of dissolves the Massachusetts Bay Charter, and he creates one essentially lump colony, what he calls the Dominion of New England. He combines Mass, Connecticut, Rhode Island, the Plymouth Colony, New York, New Jersey, New Hampshire, under a brand new royal charter. So the government is going to take over this large chunk to hopefully prevent them from getting into more fights with 
the natives in the same area to hopefully keep them under wraps and to increase control. So this is going to be one effect of King Philip's War. Another major effect of King Philip's War is going to be, as a result of this violence, the Native American population and the uh, colonial population, the white colonists, um, are really going to become more and more separated after King Philip's War, even though it only takes place um, for about a year, there is going to be a uh, kind of almost a little bit of a separation, if you will, but this movement westward of um, the native tribes pushing them deeper into the frontier, and there's going to be more of a societal division. You're not really going to see heavy Native American populations left in New England after King Philip's War. So there's going to be change in demographics. There's also going to be a change in political control. This um, kind of lumping together of, of what was um, the colonies originally are going to be pulled together. New York, New Jersey, um, what is today modern day New England is all going to be lumped together in what's called the Dominion of New England and brought under control of Charles II. However, the royal governor put in charge of controlling the dominion of New England was not liked by the Puritans, was not like any, even some of the religious moderates or any of the merchants in the area. So they really didn't like the ruler. Um, and he is kind of kicked out of power a couple years later when um, William and Mary um, begin their reign in England. Um, what's going to happen after he's kicked out? The Dominion of New England is essentially going to be dissolved. Um, Massachusetts is given its new charter, charter that kind of incorporates the Plymouth Colony. Um, and it's this big shift of power from the so-called elect, the religious elect, to those with property. So there is a shift in the role for Massachusetts. Um, of this kind of entirely religiously dominated theocracy, along with something um, that we're going to talk about in a second called the Salem Witch Trials. It's going to impact the role of religion in society, but also these other colonies are going to be carved back out again. The Salem Witch Trials and this fear of witchcraft in New England is probably one of the most well-known things um, by people that have not studied colonial history. It's this kind of note that people find so fascinating. How could they actually believe there were witches? How could they put people to death? Um, and so we're going to look at that a little bit deeper. But what's more important as we're looking at it is if you notice for each one of these incidents is we haven't really looked at the cause of the incident, but more so the effects in most case. That's the important part, the long term effects. Um, this so-called Salem Panic, as it's sometimes referred to, of 1691, led to 20 different public executions before the, the witch trials were eventually halted. And it takes place mostly in the town of Salem, which is north of Boston. Now, people want to know, though, what caused this thing? What was it? How how would anything happen? Um, one of these possible solutions, and there's people that have wrote giant essays and books on this, this matter, but some people believe it just to be simply arguments over church um, matters between different ministers fighting for power in the colony. Other people... Um, believe it to be sort of this battle between the haves and the have-nots of the poor farmers versus the rich farmers trying to gain land. Some people believe it might be a reaction to increased liberation or independent women because the people that were put to death, although they were not all women, they were definitely a majority of women who were accused. And so if you were accused of witchcraft, you were taken to trial and this person could bring this charge against you, what could you say? You could either say, I'm a witch, and you're put to death, or you could say, I'm not. And someone would say, that's exactly what a witch would say. Um, so there's not really a good line of defense. You don't have uh, any sort of witness that says, no, I'm not a witch. So-and-so knows I'm not a witch. They could be an accomplice. What if this person bringing up crimes against you in a very religious town, religious area, says, I saw them dancing with the devil, that I saw them um, commingling with Satan, um, that there's not really much you can say against that. You were kind of guilty until proven innocent. Um, and many of these people were put to death. And so they would test people that only a way a witch could get out is say they'd tie somebody to a giant stone, throw them in the water. Um, and if you were a witch, obviously you would free yourself and you would fly up and you'd be totally fine. I'm like, ha, I knew they were a witch. And then they'll go after and try to kill them. 
if you drown and you can't remove yourself, um, that means that you're not a witch. Because if you were a witch, you would have been able to get out. So, yeah, too bad. They could do the same thing. They could tie somebody to um, a stake and burn them alive. And a witch would be able to get themselves out or not be harmed. Um, somebody else, not so much. So this is this really backwards fear. Some people say that um, poor harvest, that there was some sort of bacteria in the grain that led to these hallucinations. Regardless of the reason about why this happened, the effects of it are going to lead to a decrease in religious power in New England. These are a couple different depictions of the Salem Witch Trials, kind of bringing um, these people in in front of the elect, in front of the clergy. But because of the paranoia of these people being put to death, um, there's going to be some effects. Number one, you have um, King Philip's War and then the dissolving of the Dominion of New England and these new charters that are issued, along with the Salem Witch Trials, um, are going to really shift power in colonial society, more specifically in Puritan Massachusetts, um, where it's going to go from being um, one that's completely controlled by the religious elect to moving away from that control. So there are going to be definite imprints and major effects of this heavy religious society in the development of New England and the way that it is the way that it is. Um, but it is not going to be as present moving forward. There's going to be this decline of this so-called theocracy. Um, there's going to be a shift more to these merchants or the people that do own land. And so land ownership in the 13 colonies is going to become increasingly important no matter which colony you are living in. By 1700, when we're looking about big claims we can make about the British colonies, we can look, number one, about England's attitude. Um, from the first settlement of Jamestown in 1607 up to the end of the 17th century, up to the year 1700, um, England's attitude towards the colonies have, have really have changed. They've gone from really being private enterprises in the first half of the 1700s all the way to by the time you get to 1700, the middle of the 1600s where the shift really happens, but by 1700, this has really taken hold, is this shift towards mercantilism, this economic value to the colonies and this increased involvement and concern for how the colonies are sort of developing and being run. They realize, the crown that is, realizes how valuable these colonies are. Um, we see them as part of this mercantilistic system exporting this massive amount of raw materials to the um, mother country, England, that is going to take, produce it to manufacture goods, sell back, sell to Africa to slave for trade that are going to go over to the New World to help them get more raw materials. And so this international trade really begins, transatlantic trade really takes foot um, between the British colonies in North America and the mother country. But what is super unique about what's going on in the colonies is that each region is so different. There are sectional differences about what they value, how they develop, whether you compare what we did at the very beginning when we looked at the differences between the Chesapeake colonies and the New England colonies in terms of social hierarchy and what's important to them, how they developed, why they developed. That is super, super unique where the kind of differences between each region are so, so profound. And lastly, when you're looking at all of these colonies, um, yes, they were all part of Great Britain, but they really didn't have anything to do with each other. They were all very independent. They were focusing on their own issues. They were focusing on their own governance. They were focusing on their own economies. They were focusing on their own issues. They were not this largely unified front, like the false depiction that a lot of people get for the American Revolution, where there's still lots of division during the American Revolution and the Revolutionary War. Um, and during this time, that is most certainly true, where they are not unified. It's gonna take time before they come up more unified, but they won't really be completely unified. We can track this for quite some time. Where, how much disunity is this scene and, and where does this unity really begin? That's a wrap for today, folks. Um, in terms of the 17th century colonial society, we covered a good amount of breadth. Um, we really took a look at a lot of different compare and contrasts. But if you have any questions about anything regarding the 17th century, feel free to drop a comment down in the section below. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. In terms of the 18th century, that's going to be our next video. So we are going to be talking about what is life like in the colonies now that they've all been set up for a while, now that we know why they've come there, now that we know what's come before. We're going to talk about 
what is life like leading up into the time that we consider the American Revolution, the meat of this course, with the most important parts beginning. So um, we'll see that next time. But for now, I'm out. Peace.